But it was a different story in the remote jungles of the world, particularly in equatorial Africa. Many of the early accounts of the flora and fauna of West and Central Africa came from missionaries and explorers. In 1776, the Abbe Levain Bonaventure Proyar wrote in the history of Luongo, Kakanga, and other kingdoms in Africa about a group of French missionaries who had found the tracks of an enormous unknown animal in the jungle. Pinkerton's translation, published in 1914, reads, It must be monstrous. The prints of its claws are seen upon the earth and formed an impression on it of about three feet in circumference. In observing the posture and disposition of the footprints, they concluded that it did not run this part of the way and that it carried its claws at a distance of seven or eight feet, one from the other. Prints this large could only have been made by an animal the size of an elephant, but elephants do not possess clawed toes. What kind of monster was it? New clues were to come as more reports began to emerge from Africa about this mystery monster. Alfred Aloysius Smith, otherwise known as Trader Horn, was an ivory trader in Central Africa, plying his trade along the river system of Gabon and Cameroon. He wrote a book called Trader Horn, A Young Man's Astounding Adventures in 19th Century Equatorial Africa, detailing his journeys into jungles teeming with buffalo, gorillas, man-eating leopards, serpents, and dead hunters. I Behind the Cameroons, there's things living we know nothing about. I could have made books about many things. The Jaganini, they say, is still in the swamps and rivers. Giant diver, it means. Comes out of the water and devours people. Old men will tell you what their grandfathers saw, but they still believe it's there. Same as the Amali, I've always taken it to be. I've seen the Amali's footprint, about the size of a good frying pan in circumference, and three claws instead of five. In 1909, German naturalist Carl Hagenbeck recounted in his autobiography how two different explorers, a German named Hans Schomburg and an English hunter, both described a monster that was half elephant, half dragon, which lived in the Congo swamps. Joseph Mengus, another naturalist, told Hagenbeck that some kind of dinosaur, akin to the Brontosaurus, lived in the swamps. Hagenbeck sent an expedition to the Congo to search for the monster but the effort was quickly aborted due to disease and hostile natives. Hans Schomburg, an animal tracker in the employ of Hagenbeck, also recounted to Hagenbeck that hippopotami were absent from Lake Bangweulu in Zambia. The natives said this was because of the fearful monster which inhabited the lake. Hagenbeck, who was director of the Hamburg Zoo, has been acclaimed as one of the greatest animal collectors of all time. In his book, Beasts and Men, published in 1912, he wrote, On the walls of certain caverns in Central Africa, there are to be found actual drawings of this strange creature. From what I have heard of the animal, it seems to me that it can only be some kind of dinosaur, seemingly akin to the Brontosaurus. As the stories come from so many different sources, and all tend to substantiate each other, I am almost convinced that some such reptile must still be in existence. In 1913, the German government decided to survey its then colony of Cameroon and chose Captain Friar von Stein Zulausnitz to lead the expedition. Von Stein included the following fascinating report on a creature, quote, very much feared by the Negroes of certain parts of the territory of the Congo, the Lower Yabangi, the Sangha, and the Ikalemba rivers. They called the animal Mokelium Bembe. The animal is said to be of a brownish grape color, its size approximating that of an elephant. It is said to have a long and very flexible neck. Some spoke of a long, muscular tail like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animals are said to attack the vessels at once and to kill the crews, but without eating the bodies. The creature is said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river in the clay of its shores at shark bends. It is said to climb the shore even in daytime in search of its food. Its diet is said to be entirely vegetable. 
Unfortunately, the outbreak of World War I curtailed any further exploration of the area by von Stein, and he was obliged to return to Europe. One can only speculate what other evidences of Mkilimbembe might have been discovered if he had continued with his expedition. In 1932, Scottish explorer Ivan Sanderson and American naturalist Gerald Russell were on an animal collecting expedition in northern Cameroon when they came to Momfe Pool on the Mainyu River. The cliff-like riverbanks at this location had many caves, some partially submerged. The travelers reported a loud disturbance as of fighting beasts, followed by an ear-splitting roar of some monster. Sanderson also briefly glimpsed the back of something larger than a hippopotamus breaking the surface before quickly submerging in the murky river. Upstream, near the confluence of the Cross River, they came upon vast hippo-like tracks, although there were no hippopotami in the area. Sanderson was informed that this creature, called Mbulu Mbembe, drove the hippos away. In 1937, the publication Discovery ran an article by Captain William Hitchens entitled African Mystery Beasts. In a section on colossal lizards, it reported, Other accounts speak of a gigantic lizard with a neck like a giraffe, legs like an elephant's, a small snake-like head, and a tail 30 feet long. Several white hunters have asserted that they have tracked what must be such beasts, and the Smithsonian Institution some years ago sent an expedition to locate the animal. But the project, unfortunately, met with disaster and never arrived in the field of search. A year later, in 1938, Dr. Leo von Boxberger, who was colonial magistrate with considerable African experience, conducted an expedition into the interior of Cameroon. He also picked up reports of a large, unidentified animal living in the waters. Most of his notes on this subject were lost when his expedition was attacked by members of the Pangue tribe in Spanish Guinea. However, on the subject of the equatorial monsters, he wrote, My own contribution to the subject is unfortunately very small. At the mouth of the Mbam, in Sanaga and central Cameroons, and on the Ntem in southern Cameroons, I collected a variety of data from the natives about the mysterious water beast. All I can report is the name Mbokale Muembe, given to the animal in southern Cameroons. The belief in a gigantic water animal, described as a reptile with a long, thin neck, exists among the natives in the southern Cameroons, wherever they form part of the Congo Basin and also to the west of this area, doubtless where the great rivers are broad and deep and are flanked by virgin forest. Ten years later, in 1948, A.S. Airy was swimming at Lake Borombi Mbo near Kumba, northern Cameroon, while keeping some visiting British soldiers company. Without warning, the water at the center of the lake began to stir, as if being disturbed from below. As everyone hastily exited the water, two strange long-necked creatures broke the surface. The first animal to appear had a long neck, about 12 to 15 feet, ending in a small, slender head that sported a spike of some kind at the top. A second, slightly smaller, long-necked animal also made an appearance, but without a spike or horn. The locals later claimed that the hornless animal was a female. As Ari recalled, some of the soldiers fled the scene, but others stayed and kept the two strange animals under observation. The animals were again typical of Mokele and Bembe in appearance, but on this occasion, snake-like scales were observed on the monsters. This matches more recent reports of the larger, mature animals possessing toughened skin like a caiman. The spike on the top of the head is also suggestive of sexual dimorphism. Extinct sauropodians such as the Diplodocus are now known to have had dermal spikes up to nine inches in length. The locals call these animals Jaganini, meaning giant diver, as reported by Trader Horn in his book in 1927. The locals further stated that the animals rarely left the water and were seen infrequently, which again ties in favorably with Michele Mbembe. 
Very little was heard of Michele Mbembe until 1976, when herpetologist James Powell from Texas traveled to Gabon to study rainforest crocodiles. Powell picked up stories from the Fang people about an enormous river monster called Nyamala, and a local witch doctor named Michael Obang picked out a picture of the Diplodocus from a book on dinosaurs as being a dead ringer for the Nyamala, which he saw exit a jungle pool in 1946. Powell later conveyed this information to Dr. Roy P. Mackle, a biologist from the University of Chicago and vice president of the International Society of Cryptozoology. In 1980, Mackle and Powell traveled to the People's Republic of the Congo to investigate Michele Mbembe activity, which Mackle believed would be centered in the Likuala region, a huge area of seasonally inundated swamps that was left blank on most maps. In the northern town of Mfondo, situated on the Yabangi River, Mackle and Powell met with the Reverend Eugene Thomas from Ohio, a missionary who had served in the Congo since 1955. Thomas had heard many stories about Michele Mbembe and sent out for first-hand eyewitnesses who had seen the monster. At first, Mackle was reluctant to believe that he was on the trail of a living dinosaur, yet each witness was absolutely emphatic that the illustrations of the Apatosaurus and Diplodocus in Mackle's book on dinosaurs were dead ringers for the Michele Mbembe. All eyewitnesses agreed that Michele Mbembe's live in the rivers, streams, and swampy lakes, and that they are rare and dangerous. Time ran out for Mackle and Powell, and they headed back to the U.S., tantalized by the reports. Mackle returned to the Congo in 1981 with a larger team, and this time headed south on the Likuala Uerbis River. He attempted to reach the remote Lake Tele, a small, shallow body of water situated in the heart of the swamp where at least one Michele Mbembe was reportedly speared to death by the Bagombe pygmies in 1960. Unfortunately, the narrow water channels that led to the lake from the unexplored Bai River were jammed with fallen trees, making passage impossible with heavy dugout canoes. One flood of excitement occurred when the expedition was rounding a river bend just south of the town of Ipena. A large creature had abruptly submerged near the far bank, producing an 18-inch high wave that buffeted Mackle's canoe. Crocodiles do not leave such a wake, and hippos that do are not present in the area for they have all been chased away by Michele Mbembe's, according to the Pygmies. Scottish explorer Bill Gibbons conducted his first expedition to the Congo from November 1985 to May 1986. Although the expedition was delayed in Brazzaville for several weeks by the corrupt slow-motion bureaucratic system, American missionary Pastor Thomas graciously used his contacts in the various government departments to help them get underway. They eventually reached Lake Tele after a challenging five-day slog through the forest where they observed gorillas, chimpanzees, large pythons, crocodiles, and turtles, but no large monster. They also found that the fear of Michele Mbembe was considerable among the rural Congolese, which made information gathering very difficult at times. Their guides hunted daily and on one occasion shot a monkey that they were unable to identify. The remains, the skin and head, were preserved in formaldehyde and later presented to the British Museum of Natural History in London, England. The monkey was later classified as a new subspecies of Crestless Mangabe monkey. Gibbons returned to the Congo in November 1992 to deliver emergency medical supplies to a missionary clinic in Mfondo run by Jean and Sandy Thomas. On this occasion, Gibbons and his team headed north on the unexplored Bai River and pushed its way northwest through dense swamps where they found two small lakes that were not even on the maps. Once again, the native guides were fearful of remaining in the area and the exploration of the swamps was cut short. Although many of the inhabitants of the Likuala region know exactly where a specimen of Michele Mbembe can be readily observed in film, they believe that to speak openly of the animals to white outsiders means death. 
It was nothing more than fear and superstition that was stopping Gibbons from making a major discovery. In 1994, a civil war broke out in the Congo, scotching any possibility of a third expedition there. At this point, Gibbons began to look for an alternative location in Central Africa in order to continue his search and decided to take another look at Cameroon. The south of the country, which borders the Congo, has scarcely been explored and is still rich in lush forests, swamps, and deep, broad rivers, just as Friar von Stein had described it in 1913. In November 2000, Gibbons traveled to Cameroon with Dave Wetzel from Concord, New Hampshire. They teamed up with Pierre Sema, a Cameroonian national who worked with an American missionary team and hunted regularly in the jungle with the Baca Pygmies. After purchasing additional supplies, Gibbons, Wetzel, and Sema headed south on some of the worst roads imaginable. The team spent days on end slogging through waist-high swamp, going from one pygmy village to another. However, their efforts were rewarded with first-hand eyewitness accounts of Killing Bembe activity dating from 1986 to April 2000. Although the Baca people refer to the animals as Lakila Bembe, they described the animals exactly as the Kelly pygmies in the Congo and confirmed that the monsters still inhabited the rivers, swamps, and streams of southern Cameroon. The pygmies also described the monster as having a series of dermal spikes running down the length of its neck, back, and tail. This surprised Gibbons and Wetzel, as this is a physical feature of sauropod dinosaurs that was unknown to paleontologists until 1991. Additional information was also gathered about other strange animals that reputedly inhabit the forest and swamps, including a large quadruped armed with a heavy neck frill and up to four horns on its head. More native witnesses immediately picked out a picture of the Triceratops as being a dead ringer for this animal, which was reputed to kill and disembowel elephants. Gibbons and Wetzel were also surprised to find that, unlike the pygmies of the Congo, the Baca pygmies of Cameroon do not attach any supernatural or mythical beliefs to the mystery animals of southern Cameroon, and were happy to answer all the questions presented to them, thus providing a great deal of information about the suspected dinosaurs. As a test, the team showed the pygmies pictures of other animals, such as the North American bear, which they did not recognize, thus establishing a measure of accuracy and truthfulness in their reporting. Enthralled by their progress, the team returned home, greatly motivated by the knowledge that important progress had been made in the search for Michele Mbembe. In February 2002, Gibbons returned to Cameroon with a four-man Christian expedition. Much valuable time was lost due to problems in finding suitable transportation. However, they did make it back into the target area again with the help of translator Pierre Sima, new eyewitnesses arrived and gave even more valuable information on Michele Mbembe and other mystery animals of the region. It was, however, the dry season and the river level was very low and very little time was left for actual field research. Any chance of observing a Michele Mbembe will only happen right at the end of the wet season which is the best time to observe Michele Mbembe's, according to almost all eyewitnesses. In November 2003, Gibbons returned again to Cameroon with Brian Sass from Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Along with Pierre Sima, the two men discovered a narrow stream on the Jaw River, isolated by a thick jungle island near the Congo side of the river.
At least five caves, partially submerged in the river on the Congo bank, were visible, and the locals told the explorers that these were inhabited by at least three or four Mokelein Bembes. The area was known as the Lizon Interdite, or the Forbidden Zone. Gibbons and Sass had difficulty in keeping the same river guides to take them into the area, no matter how much money they offered. The Mokele and Bembe's, they were told, lived in that area, and it was a bad place for the natives to go. On the final exploration of the channel, Pierre Sima and the two native river guides observed a huge, football-shaped, snake-like head attached to a thick neck moving across the river about a hundred feet ahead of their canoe. Gibbons and Sass, sitting in the rear of the canoe, were unable to stand erect in the narrow canoe, lest the entire team end up in the fast-flowing channel. Later, when they all reached the safety of the riverbank, the two boatmen explained that they observed a huge animal walking across the river ahead of them. The river was at least 20 feet deep at the time, thus ruling out an elephant, crocodile, turtle, or a snake, as the strength of the river current would have affected the passage of these animals. In February 2004, Brian Sass returned to the Forbidden Zone with Peter Beach, a microbiologist from Portland, Oregon. The river by this time had dropped considerably and the caves along the Congo side of the bank had been sealed up from within, with the mud becoming as hard as concrete. All right, the uh, caves uh, were filled with debris, with uh, rocks and dirt. Uh, this is a fairly uh, dense material it wasn't sandy at all, it was more like cement. At any rate, I, we got on the, uh, one of these uh, little outcroppings where the uh, uh, cave entrance was, and uh, there were some holes, some uh, large diggings. And we looked at those uh, very closely, and we found that there were um, holes in those holes. The expedition returned with plaster casts of the claws of the animal. One of the plaster casts came out like this. Another one did two, two or three of them look very similar. And that is essentially one digit uh, of a digging tool on the hand of, of an animal. All right, as I was digging uh, one of the plaster casts out, some, such as this, uh, was with my machete, uh, popped it out, and as I was scraping, I made quite a bit of noise. And I noticed as I pulled it out, I heard a scraping on the other side of the um, cave. It sounded like it was only a few feet away from me, maybe two or three feet. And it sounded like it was hollow on the inside. And it sounded like there was something alive that was in there. I said to my partners, you know, did you hear that? And uh, Brian, Brian Sass, my other friend uh, there, he said, no, he didn't. Here and, and Pierre said, yeah, I heard it, get in the canoe. Uh, but my mind was on, well, let's dig it out. I had no idea how big this animal was, really. Uh, but Pierre was smart enough to get us back in the canoe, forced us to go across the uh, river at that point and get back on the island and, and then observe. Nothing else happened there. So we started looking around that island and we found on the island footprints, many footprints. The impressions revealed that at least two adults and a juvenile animal, all as big as elephants, had been feeding in the immediate area, with leaves being stripped from the trees to a height of 18 feet. Sema estimates that the animals were much bigger than elephants, with a head height of at least 18 feet, which is as tall as a male giraffe. The footprints were approximately a uh, foot wide. They obviously had pads. They had uh, nails, toenails that were in there. And they were shaped in such a way in a fan shape. There were a, uh, three footprints that went one, two, three. So the overall shape was about like so with three, two, three. But each one of those had three nails, three nails, three nails. And then, about 50 inches up, apart from that, was another set, the same way. Now, Pierre is a tracker, and he told me what, after looking at this, and you could see he was puzzling through it, he said, well, what this animal is doing is it's moving its feet, it's moving its feet, and moving sideways, feeding up in the branches. 
Now, this was not a three giant toed animal. This was an animal with a foot that's approximately a foot wide, that's maybe 18 inches long, that uh, feeds up into the branches, probably on its hind feet, because we didn't see front feet. We just saw a pair of feet. We didn't get a picture of the animal. The animal was inside the cave. We heard it inside the cave. Beyond that, we took pictures of the scratches. We took pictures of the plaster casts. We took pictures of the holes that were dug in. We took pictures of the cave entrance. Uh, we took pictures of uh, where it had been feeding, and obviously something very large had eaten its way through the forest on the island uh, back into the island, about 60 feet or so. So we have evidence, but it's just not uh, of the animal per se. In January 2006, Milt Marcy, an insurance broker from Portland, Oregon, traveled to the Jaw River in Cameroon near the Congolese border with his own team. Marcy, Peter Beach, Rob Mullen, and Pierre Sima spoke to witnesses that claimed to have observed a Mokele Bembe only two days before, but they did not discover the animal themselves. In March 2009, the History Channel series, Monster Quest, involved William Gibbons and his team and a two-man film crew from White Wolf Productions. It took place in Cameroon, in the region of the Jaw, Bumba, and Ngoko rivers near the border with the People's Republic of the Congo. The episode aired in the summer of 2009 and also featured an interview with Roy P. Mackle and Peter Beach of the Milk Marcy Expedition 2006. While no sightings were reported on the expedition due to the advent of the dry season and low depth of the rivers, the team found evidence of a large underground cave with air vents and observed sonar readings of very long serpentine shapes underwater. The film crew also recorded the impressive zoologically accurate drawings made by several Michele and Bembe eyewitnesses that were clearly representative of a sauropod dinosaur complete with the bulky body, long neck and tail, and series of dermal spikes running the length of the neck, back, and tail. Additional information revealed that the animals also possessed an air sac, similar to a bullfrog, which enabled it to make loud, bellowing vocalizations. In November 2012, Bill Gibbons returned with a new crew and traveled over 100 kilometers north on the Jaw River to explore an area close to the Inki Falls. I am Michel Ballot, cryptozoologist. <laughs> I research Monkele Membe and the Water Panther. Yep. And Doddy with Bill Gibbon and John Cobb. Wonderful. This remote area is completely free from villages and human activity of any kind, thus providing a tranquil location for any Mokele Mbembe. What do you think that Mokele Mbembe is? Well, that's a very good question. Um, over the years in conducting these expeditions, the descriptions have remained very consistent uh, from the Congo and Central African Republic, Gabon, all the way through here to Cameroon and um, Mokele and Bambi best resembles what we would imagine a small to medium sized sauropod dinosaur would look like and certainly everything we've learned about this animal from its behavioral pattern to its preferred habitat, its food supply, all tells us that we could well be dealing with the last living dinosaur. Would a living dinosaur in fact end evolution per se? I don't think it would end evolution as such. I think it would certainly give evolutionists uh, um, food for thought. Uh, a living dinosaur should be exciting to any scientist regardless of uh, whether they're evolutionists or creationists and I believe that uh, this would give them an exciting opportunity to branch into a new area of science, uh, paleozoology, uh, where they would have a living dinosaur to discover uh, rather than uh, just the dry uh, fossilized bones. But I also believe in a nutshell that um, uh, this would also give evolutionists now uh, the task of uh, basically trying to determine why some dinosaurs survived while others went extinct. 
During their exploration of the area, the team split up, leaving Gibbons and Kirk at the camp to observe the river from there. We're standing on the banks of the River Jar. We're approximately 96 kilometers from the nearest settlement in Ndongo where the World Wildlife Fund maintains a facility. The two men suddenly heard three distinct roars coming from the river in the south. The thick foliage prevented the explorers from observing the creature that was making the loud vocalizations. Upon the third roar, the noise of the outboard engine of the expedition canoe returning to the camp caused the animal to retreat from the area. Man. It was Could be. Because remember somebody said it makes a noise like, uh, on a dit uh, que le bruit est comme... Exactement. In the river? Oui. In the river. It was Mokerimende. The question remains. Why has no one succeeded in photographing or filming a Mukele Mbembe? The vastness of the area, the difficulty of the terrain, the semi-aquatic habits of the animal, the fear that it imparts among the local tribes people, as well as the limited amount of time and funding that is available to explorers, all contribute to this daunting task. However, Gibbons and his American colleagues have now established beyond all doubt that Mokele Mbembe is not only a living creature, but are most often encountered in the Jaw River in Cameroon. Further, the upper reaches of the Jaw, which is remote and almost completely void of all human activity, is where some of the animals have retreated. The race is now on to return to this location and finally secure the film and photographic evidence that will silence the critics and the hardline evolutionists once and for all while providing powerful evidence for a young earth and special creation. Will you help us at last film a specimen of Mokele Mbembe, the ultimate living fossil?